to the man, the legend, Mr. Kenny Aronoff. Thank you. Which one is <laughs> too early to drink? Awesome. Thank you very much. Welcome. Yeah. You have a good radio voice. Thank you. I, I was, when I was like 19, I was going to go into radio. And then you got I the didn't voice. because you got the they voice. told me how much it pays. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, but it's never same, too late. the same with, with music, you know. It, and now it's pay to play. Mm -hmm. But I, I got through that, and uh, I get paid. I get paid to play, <laughs> or I don't show up. <laughs> um, so we're going to kind of format this today. We're, we're referring to this as in conversation with uh, a new series that we're going to try and inaugurate starting this year with you. Um, so I think we'll take some questions from the audience at one point, but to get things rolling, uh, we'll just chat a little bit about uh, about you. Uh, and um, the first thing I kind of want to start with, because if anyone has noticed, um, we've got your book for sale today. You've written a book. I know. Because apparently you're not busy enough. Yeah. So uh, can you explain to us, please, uh, why did you decide to write a book? I didn't want to write a book. Um, <laughs> I, was, I really didn't. Um, I would come off this tour of Chicken Foot. Does anybody know that band? Yeah. It's like, yeah, badass bands. I call it the best rock band I ever played in because it, it was the most fun, most relaxed, but it was a super group. Sammy Hagar from Van Halen, Sammy Hagar, Ronnie Montrose, and Chickenfoot, and then Michael Anthony, bass player from Van Halen, and then the, the virtuosic um, Joe Satriani. And Chad Smith, the drummer from the Peppers, Chili Peppers, is the regular drummer. He couldn't do it because he had a day job he had to go to making $8 billion uh, a week <laughs> with the Chili Peppers. So he said, you should hire Kenny. So. At the end of that tour, they, somebody was writing, uh, Jake Brown was writing a book about Satriani wanted to interview me. And I'm, you know, pretty passionate and intense and I was getting into all kinds of things uh, besides Joe, <laughs> my philosophies on life. And he says, dude, I want to, I got to write a book about you. And I'm like, ah, I don't got time. I'm always recording, I'm always touring. I don't have time. He says, no, no, it's easy. You just dictate to me and that, he made it sound like, you know, I dictate some stuff to him, and the next thing you know, I won a, an Oscar. <laughs> you know, nothing, and as, as you read, if you read my book, nothing comes easy. You know, the things that have value a lot of times, um, I mean, in other words, we're not born perfect. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn through life. You have to learn through mistakes to be great at something. I show that in the book. So, long story short, we start dictating this stuff back and forth, and about a year and a half later, I started reading what he had, and I, I, I didn't like it. I, I just thought, it wasn't that Jake Brown was a bad writer, it's just that it wasn't in my voice. Ah. It didn't sound like me. Mm -hmm. So then I started getting involved with it on my days off on tour. This is exactly what I didn't want to do. On my days off on tour, I was 16 hours a day trying to rewrite one chapter. Who, has anybody read the book at all? Awesome. It sounds like me, right? The way I'm talking, you know, and that was the point. I wanted to sound like me. At, at one point, the book, by the way, was 600 pages. It's like making a movie. They chop, chop a lot out. What I do is I found calendars uh, of every year from 1977 till now, which had every session, every tour, uh. every day of my life in a year. And so I started categorizing uh, in a, like in a Word document, 1977. These are the recordings, these are live shows, and some personal life. And you documented all that? I had it, I, had it, I kept it. Somehow I had wow. those calendars, and maybe it was for this reason. So that's how I start, we started then doing the interviews that way. I would prepare uh, a chapter briefly based on the, the 1977, and I'd write this thing out. Then I'd let him come up with the questions. In the end, when I had about 600 pages, I called up the publisher, had a checkbook in my right hand, the phone in my right, left hand, right hand, and I said, listen, and I'd already had John Mellencamp interviewed, John Bon Jovi interviewed, Billy Corgan from the Pumpkins, Melissa Etheridge, John Fogarty, and I called up the publisher and said, how much is it going to cost for me to buy this book back and bury it? This book sucks. <laughs> That's what I said. And I, really I was embarrassed. I thought... This can't come out like this. He went, whoa, 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 chill, relax, relax. 
He says, we need an editor. And see, I've learned all this. That's why when I watched that film last night, I understand so much more about, you know, the, the process of this sort of thing. Yeah. You leave a lot on the floor. So he says, the editor is going to shape this. And I'm like, I don't believe you. So I met with the editor in New York. He was a drummer. He'd written books and was there. I said, I'll give you three chapters. You wrote two chapters, edited three chapters. A lot of cool shit got dumped out, like, you know, an evening with Cameron Diaz. When I met Dave Grohl once, hung over, and he said he's got this new band called the Foo Fighters and wanted me to go to a, you know, the, the uh, you know, see if he was going to get a record deal. I mean, stuff like that. But stuff had to be let go to make the book have a direction and flow properly. All this stuff I learned. And the bottom line is, I did the same process with the editor. I went through every page. And I remember we were six months late with the book, then two weeks late. I changed the cover the day it was supposed to be handed in. Wow. It went, I just, my gut said it's not good enough. And I said to the publisher, I don't like the cover. He says, well, we think it looks pretty good. I went, all right. I'm not Mick Jagger, but I want what Mick Jagger likes. Mick Jagger would think that book sucks. That cover is not cool. It's not cool. The font looks bad. I says, make it look like something great that Mick Jagger would like. So I got with an artist. The artist, uh, 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 the artist turned it from color to black and white and came up with all these fonts. And after about two weeks, I settled on that. The discographies I came up with took weeks and weeks because I wanted it to be accurate because nobody's going to record like that ever again. Yeah. The budgets are gone. So it's kind of a, a historic piece now. I wanted people to really see what it's like to have been me, be me, and what my future is going to be. Because it ain't over. You know? And as I say at the end of the book, as long as I'm alive and kicking, I'm going to be doing some shit. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, and, you know, um, okay. So that's how the book, uh, you know, I feel really good about it. I had to let it go at one point. I mean, the last two weeks, I'm trying to read a whole book within 24 hours. Came up with 30 pages of edits. Wow. They put them in, and the guy said, I said, I'm going to read it again. I read it again. You know, I'm, I'm sitting, I mean, I'm falling asleep and drinking coffee, reading this thing. Had another 15 pages. I says, all right, we got it, right? He says, no, I want to read it. I read it again. I got more edits. He says, really? We start fighting. I'm like, dude, it ain't right yet. Finally, I had to let it go, and, I, and I'm, really, I'm really happy with it, you know, on the most part. But, you know, it's funny because um, I do a lot, I work a lot in production. Right. And, and editing, editing, and, and there's a tendency, especially if you have a deadline, and sometimes it's an arbitrary deadline right. to hit, uh, you, can, you can get to the point where you say, okay, you know what, it's good enough. Let's, but... Do you want, you have one shot at this. Is, yeah. do you want good at, when you're performing, is it, are you out there going, you know, as long as I do yeah, a good enough job yeah. tonight, no, right? That's not me. I have, a, I have a, a phrase, it's this. I will never be as great as I want to be, but I'm willing to spend the rest of my life trying to be as great as I can be. Yeah. That's like running back in yeah. football. They don't score a touchdown, right? I mean, you don't score a touchdown every time, but he's trying. Yes. And so, yes, I don't get nervous before I play anymore. It doesn't matter if I'm in front of the president. I just did a, 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 a um, I get hired for these shows. It was a Merle Haggard tribute in uh, Nashville. I played with Willie Nelson, Keith Richards from the Stones, John Mellencamp, my ex-boss. Played with Loretta Lynn, Toby Keith, Jamie Johnson, Shell Crow, uh, 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 Ronnie Dunn from Brooks and Dunn, uh, Kenny Chesney. Uh, Billy, <laughs> Billy Gibbons, Warren Haynes, um, I'm skipping all kinds of people. Point is, they're filming it with a 16 camera shoot and they're recording it. I cannot make a mistake. <laughs> I don't get nervous before these shows, I get serious. This is no joke. And I have to hold this thing down. And shit is gonna go wrong and I gotta make sure that at the end of that show, that I'm, they don't have to fix anything, and they didn't. But my preparation is off the hook. I write every single note out. I have every tempo. I have who to count off to, what the count off is, and I rehearse this before the show over and over again, and the endings, so that I am controlling this whole thing. So 
Is it going to be perfect? Hopefully. Will there be some uh, questionable moments? Probably, because <laughs> a lot of these people we didn't rehearse until the day of the show. So, yes, I'm always striving to do the best I can um, and have to accept the human aspect that it never, it's not, sometimes it's not going to be perfect, but as long as my worst day is A or A minus, that's good. And I will keep trying. I never assume that, that I'm, I'm set now. I, I, from the book, I came up with seven ways that I believe people can be successful in their life and their career. Seven ways to be successful in your life and career. I learned that from writing the book. I went back and looked at, like, how did I do this? Who am I? Because I always am forward thinking. I'm always thinking, well, what I did is what I did. I'll talk about that when I'm 100. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, right now I'm focusing on what I'm doing next. That's forward thinking. As soon as I score a touchdown, let's say I was a football player, I'm thinking, give me the ball, I want to do it again. And the seven things are pretty basic, you know, self-discipline, hard work, fueled by passion, education, creating a plan that you execute to reach your goals, communication skills, teamwork. I get hired because people want me in the room with them. I save sessions. They want me on that stage because they know I'm going to control the session, the, I mean, the, the live performance and make it go great for everybody. The fifth thing is RPS. Repetition of anything is the preparation for success. Repeat any skill, even diet, exercise, raising a family. Repeat anything over and over and over again and it prepares you for success. That is not to be disputed. Number six is healthy life is a wealthy life. I have eight steps of health to be mentally, physically, and emotionally strong. Otherwise, your health goes, none of this can happen. And the seventh key is to stay relevant and focused because the world is changing. I have adapted and adapted and adapted, and that's what's kept me relevant and in the game. Now, those seven things I learned from the book, but I'm going deeper because now I'm writing a second book. And it's based on those seven things, like the method, the Kenny Aronoff method, how to be successful, right? But why is the question, did I do that? Why did I work so hard? Why was I so disciplined? Why when John Mellencamp said, you're not playing on this record, I said, yes, I am. Oh, no. He said, you're not playing on this record. You go home. And I went, no. He says, well, you go home. I went, no. That's like someone saying, you're fired. And you go, no, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> you go, no, you're fired. What don't you understand? You don't mean that. I mean, you know what I mean? So... Why was I like that? And here's, this is the heavy part. The reason why I am the way I am, think about this. When we're born, we're dying. I have chosen to live my life until I die as opposed to die on the vine. People are dying on the vine. When you give up, you're dying on the vine. I was so afraid to fail, so embarrassed to fail, I didn't want to fail in front of my friends, myself, my family, anybody, that it was like, if I failed, it was like dying. And in a sense, I have died many times, and that's when you make a mistake and come back to life, and improved, and now I'm stronger and better than I've ever been because I've gone through that process of dying and coming back. The fear of death, or the fear of failure is what has propelled me to do those seven things. That is what the next book's about, and that's that's the bomb right there. Yeah, let's hear that. Um, were you always like that? So let's here's here's you know 16, 18, 21 year old Kenny Aronoff. The the desire to succeed, the fear of failure, say yeah. the um, the self discipline. Did you have, do you feel you had all those qualities ingrained in you from a very long, young age? Or did that come with age and experience and, and falling yeah. off the horse and getting back on? Okay, we all have our own unique DNA. That's a starting point. My, my the new book is going to be about whatever your DNA is, you have to make the best of it. I mean, can you accept giving up and dying? I mean, it's just like, what a horrible thought. I, look it, 
You know, I talk, I talk a lot of time. I, I'm not into laziness and entitlement and all this stuff. And the, I mean, the millennials are, are nailed for this. But you know what? I identify with the millennials. I'm as pissed off about the shit they're pissed off about. But what I'm saying is, yeah, we're going to get fucked, you guys. We're going to get beaten down. The government's going to try to take our money. Someone's going to try to take your job. Blah, blah, blah. That's a given. That's a given. That's what I'm saying. It's a given, man. It's a war out there. I'm saying you've got to try no matter what. So I'm not the most talented drummer in the world, but those seven skills brought me to where I am right now. There are a million drummers that are more talented or faster or this or that. But it, with, if you're, you can't survive on just talent alone. You have to make something with what you were given. So I guess my positive thoughts are on this is try anyway. You have to try. If nothing else, the experiences you get from trying and learning, failing and getting back on the horse, failing, getting back on the horse, experiencing your emotions, experiencing fear, pain, bum, being bummed out, uh, um, all these emotions, you, you know, being angry, you need to grab onto them, not ignore them. Grab onto them, experience it, and then you get used to this is what and who I am. Know thyself. That's a big part of my book. Know who you are. Because if you know who you are, think about this. If you know who you are, then it's easy to say, no, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that. Obviously, when you work for a boss and the guy says, hey, you have to do that, and you can't go, no, I'm not. You have to say, although I did say that to Mellencamp, but I came up with an alternative. My point is at least know who you are. Because if you don't like where you are, you can change that. You can go through life a lot faster and go advance through life if you know who you are. At least don't bullshit yourself. Know who you are and then figure out how you can live your life as you are. You'll, you'll, you'll become way more successful. Even I'm not talking about fame or even money. Just successful in your own heart and mind. And you will not be dying on the vine if you know thyself and you work from there. That's an important ingredient. So, yes, I didn't know the guy I was back then like I do now. Because when I wrote the book and I looked back, I went, wow. I asked my mom when I saw the Beatles on TV at 11 years old, call up the Beatles. I want to play in the Beatles. <laughs> and she didn't call them up because she didn't have the number, and, uh, you know, and I went, well, I don't accept that, but there I was playing Beatles songs, damn it, I'm going to be in the Beatles my own way, and wow, I didn't realize I was that guy, and like when, and then I was so afraid when, I, in my family, you all went to college, and I went, I picked music, but there was no, where I grew up was a small town, 3,000 people, no drum teacher there, definitely nobody teaching rock and roll, because I was born in 1805. No, I'm just joking. And, um, but I, there was nobody teaching rock and roll, there was no mentors, I was self-taught. And the only instruction I could get was in classical music. So when it went time to go to college, I decided I'd audition and I barely got into the University of Massachusetts as a music performance major, but I had to play marimba, timpani, snare drum, music theory, music history, conducting, piano, sight singing, orchestra, jazz, I mean, it was full on plus academics. My fear of going to that first year in college and being behind scared me so much, I started working, practicing eight hours a day. Wow. So, is that my DNA? Probably, yeah. but logically, doesn't that make sense? If you want to be the best, yeah. it ain't going to come from the sky. You got, you got to earn it. You have to put in the work. You got to put in the work. I had to put in the work. And you know what? That year, I was the worst percussionist. But that year, I was so not, didn't want to die on the vine that I auditioned for Eastman, thinking, well, this school isn't as good as Eastman. Eastman's top three in, in, the, in the country. And I should be in the best school, even though I wasn't the best at, at this school. I got in. They didn't have room for me. Then there was some hot cellist who was going to this thing called the Aspen School of Music in Aspen, Colorado, run by Juilliard, one of the other two top schools in the country. I'm, I auditioned to follow her. 
I didn't get in, but then the last day of school, I'm about to drive home, and I go back to get my mail because I forgot to check. I got accepted. Wow. I, I was an alternate, I think, because who? why would you get accepted two weeks before? I go to Aspen, absolutely the worst. Anybody read my book, you, you, you know how I got just completely humiliated by this conductor, making fun of me in front of everybody. I was... Oh, I was so embarrassed, so humiliated. Another experience where I didn't quit. I stayed in there. At that camp, the teacher who taught, was teaching percussion taught at the number one school in the country, Indiana University. I demanded an audition to go there the next year. And in that summer, I demanded. He said, no, come back in January. I went, no, I want to go now. I auditioned and got in. In one year, I went from UMass, Eastman, Aspen, Indiana. And when I wrote this book, I went, oh my God, I didn't, I didn't realize I was that guy. I didn't realize. But whether I am or not, that's what I had to do. Then at Indiana University, I worked my way from the bottom to the top. Friday and Saturday nights, to beat out my, my competition, I practiced Friday and Saturday nights till midnight. Then I went out and partied because everybody else wasn't practicing. There was one guy practicing who was the timpanist in the Calgary Symphony Orchestra, Tom Miller, and he was a senior, I was a freshman. I stayed there, and I was not great, but I mean, how was I gonna get better if I didn't practice? I'm developing skills that made such a huge career that made it so I could even write a book, something to talk about. But a lot of this stuff you're talking about, I think it goes with rule number one, it's the self-discipline to be able to, I, I interview uh, often in my other job um, elite athletes or athletes, people who are at the top of their game in a different field. The common theme, you know, when I talk, you talk to a 16 year old or, or a 17 year old who isn't going out clubbing with their friends on the weekend because they're training for eight hours a day, right? Because they want to yeah. be the best. That's what you're talking yeah. about. That, yes. I find it has to be wired into your DNA because it's a very unique quality, I think, that, that makes you rise. Well, it's a combination of talent, but also the tenacity. Oh, absolutely. And you can learn self-discipline. The first time I learned self-discipline in a big way, see you know what self-discipline is? It's doing something you don't necessarily want to do, but it gets you the results you want. Right. Doing something, making yourself do something you don't want to do, but you get the results you want. Junior year, 16 years old, I have to take chemistry. Look, the most important, yeah, the most important thing to me was sports, music, and going to school was social hour for me. That's where I was hanging out with girls and my friends. And but academics, uh, it was just something I had to do. But when I, but you had to get through chemistry, you couldn't bullshit your way through that. I was terrified of chemistry, and the teacher was this kind of like drill sergeant guy who's scary. So I went. Oh my God. And I, and I talk about this. Sometimes you have to look at the same thing differently. The same thing differently. Some, it's, sometimes it's not like, okay, this is not working. You don't have to necessarily reinvent the wheel. Just look at the same thing you're doing, but look at it differently. So my way of studying, has anybody read a book and you know, you're reading, you've gone 30 pages and you go like, wow, what did I just read? Right? Yeah. I can tell you're like that. Yeah. I'm probably ADHD. <laughs> yeah. I'm probably every letter in the alphabet, AD, you know. But I'm that guy because I'm always thinking, God, that chick. Oh, man, rock and roll Zeppelin. Yeah, man. Shit, man, I got to score a goal on Saturday. Oh, back to the music. Back to the girls. Back to the... Uh, oh, I'm reading a book to get tested on tomorrow. You know, it's the last thing I'm thinking about. So I looked. I went, okay, chemistry. Whoa, this is scary shit. I went, all right. Like this time, you know, I'd look at some, when I'd study in the past, and go, eh, I looked at it, turned the page. Hey, I got through it, yeah. I don't know one thing I read. This time I went, okay, I'm not going to turn the page until I know the algebra formula and what they're talking about. I went to the teacher and I asked him and I kept doing it. I, bottom line is I got an A in my first quiz. A in my second quiz, got an A in chemistry. The self-discipline, because of fear and the hard work, got me the result I wanted, an A. I felt so good about myself. Feeling something is the magic to learning because it's one thing if you 
intellectualized on something, but once you experience it and feel that great reward, then you, that, that's knowledge. That's like, that's now you go, okay, I want that feeling again. It's like a high. It's like a drug. So now I was accepted by, obviously, musicians, athletes, social life, but now I was accepted by the teachers and my parents, and I felt like I'd completed myself. I took that same discipline and applied it to everything in my life from that day on. When you were, you said, 11 years old, you know, watching the Beatles on TV play, now you said small town, no music mentors of any sort. How did you know, or did you know, right off the bat that it was drumming that you were interested in? Well, when I saw the Beatles, it was like a drug. I mean, there was nothing on TV. We had a black and white TV set with rabbit ears and a tin foil on it. Yeah. There's a few people who know about this, yeah. but most of you don't. <laughs> <laughs> there was no video game. It, basically, there was nothing to watch on TV, so we were outside. That's when my mom yelled at me and my brother to come inside. I thought, oh, no, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I break something? Was I smoking cigarettes? What? what you know? <laughs> I was 11, and I saw the Beatles. I went, Wow. I mean, the music was infectious, and the, they had long hair, and the girls were going crazy for these guys. And, and then I eventually saw A Hard Day's Night. It was like, oh, my God, I'd never felt anything like it. I wanted to be doing that. I got to do that. But I didn't know how. How do you do that? There's nobody yeah. saying, oh, this is what you do. There was no school of rock back then. So I just did it for fun. And 50 years later, as you'll see in the book, I end up playing with the Beatles, honoring them for that TV show I saw when I was 11. That's amazing. That's, ama that's like, wow. You know, I, I know, isn't that lucky? I'm so fortunate. But you know what? I, here's what I tell people. Dreams do come true, but not by accident. Yeah. My dreams came true. They're still coming true. But guess what? I've learned they don't come by accident. You make your dreams come true. The fact that I was asked to do that show is because I'm still relevant. All the hard work and staying in the game, staying in doing what I do, gave me the possibility of being asked to do that show. And I am grateful I got asked to do that show. What a great bookend to my life. Yeah. You know, saw the Beatles when I was a kid, and I'm now playing with Ringo Starr and Paul McCartney, honoring them for that night. I mean, they're hanging out with them and talking about it. It's like a dream come true. It's, so. a, it's a dream. But I try to share with people, your dreams will come true if you take action. You make it happen. You can make it happen. Really. It, but don't expect things to happen overnight. They're not supposed to. If you got a big break today, came from the sky, woof. If you don't have enough experience, you're going to lose that break. You're going to have to, you got to embrace your emotions. you got to Feel the fear, the anger, the disappointment. That's all good stuff. Grab it, feel it, and then get your ass up and keep going forward. Because the more you embrace that, the more you, life is not that hard. You just realize this is part of it, you know? This is one of the things, though, alluding to something you mentioned, this and you, that you mentioned a little bit earlier, is um, but one of the things that no matter how old we get, there's there's... Because uh, I came to the same sort of realization years ago that you're kind of referring to, where the sooner that you can look in the mirror and tell yourself the truth about yourself, yep. about who you are, the sooner you can get, that's the biggest hurdle I think most people have to get over in their lives. And once you can do that, then the sky's the limit. But so many people, it's getting to that yeah. point. How, how did you get to were you always like that? Something, well, this uh, is, no, I wasn't. <laughs> like, Dad heard me on the phone. You know, we only had, you know, a couple phones in the house. He heard me talking to this one girl in Boston, another girl in, in Maryland, and another girl in New York. I was obviously dating all three. But they didn't know I was dating all three. My dad sees this. I'm living at home after college, and I turned down the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra to be a rock drummer. I had created my plan, executed it, went to school, got a degree in classical music, got a job. But now I wanted, a, I had a new plan. I want to be a rock star. I want to be in the Beatles. So I'm practicing and I'm practicing eight hours a day. My dad goes, you know, Kenny, I don't want to tell you what to do because obviously, you know, you are doing some good stuff here. You've done very well for yourself. But I want you, 
But either you might ask yourself who you are, and before you can have all these relationships, maybe you should find out who you are. Have a relationship with yourself. Who are you? Talk to yourself. Be honest with yourself. Just what you're saying. And I woke up the next day. He said, when you wake up, ask yourself who you are. I woke up and I looked at my hand and went, oh my God, I've never even thought that way before. I'm like, I was really miffed. I'm like, who are you? What are you? I'm like, fuck this. I'm going to go practice eight hours. That's what I was doing. See, and that shit waited for me till I got older. And I was making mistakes, you know, and stuff in my social life. And he was right. And the thing is, once you get... Once you find out, who, if you don't bullshit yourself, that's basically what it is. Don't bullshit yourself. Because he was trying to tell me you get to know yourself is the most important thing. And it's a lifelong uh, 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 exercise, by the way. It's not like you can't suddenly just go, okay, I'm going to spend one month learning who I am and that's it. No. no way. It's an onion. You keep peeling. You have to make mistakes to learn from them. Well, somebody once told me this because, you know, I, I've gone through two divorces. <laughs> you know, I'm not proud of it, but I, I was just living the wild rock and roll lifestyle. Yeah. And a lady once said to me, you know, yeah, you might not ever get this to, together in this lifetime, but that's cool. But she says, at least be honest with yourself and then tell everybody else who you are, you know, <laughs> and, and if you get the drift. And so, and she was right. And, and eventually I did. And man, I feel, this is after all my success, I feel like this has allowed me to go to the next level. This book, speaking, the next book. And I feel, I feel, like, I'm not, I feel like I'm on the edge of a diving board, but almost at the point where I've jumped up in the air and I'm coming down and I am so confident hitting that water and I'm not sure what's going to happen when I hit the water, but I feel it's going to be great. Because I got a lot of these things in place, know thyself is a big one. You, um, you, hear, you, you hear this a lot with, um, when it comes to people who are artists, is, um, and it's something I've never understood, but um, when they decide they want to pursue a career in the arts, yeah. I do that in air quotes because that's how you always see it portrayed or you're going to do a career in the art right. and so often you hear you know this and then they don't get the family support from the things that i hear um so far that you said what was the um what was the the, the feedback or the support like at home like were your parents you know what as long as you're because obviously you're getting an education you're trying to better yourself be the best you that you can be was that good enough or would they have preferred you know you'd become a lawyer or a, you know well, I was lucky. I had the support from my, from my parents. As long as I'm working hard and they saw my passion, that I was lucky I had those parents. That's big. Yes, now, yes. my grandma was going, what's this boom, boom, bang, bang, bang? <laughs> She's this old lady from Russia. She goes, what's this boom, boom, bang, bang? Be a lawyer. Be a doctor. What is this stuff? And I just laugh at her, you know. And, you know, <laughs> you know. I mean, she's right as regard to, you know, yeah. What, to make it in the music business is like, like, you know, going deer hunting with a blindfold on and hoping you're going to hit it in the dark yeah, yeah, and hope yeah. you're going to hit a deer. But I did it, but I made it happen. I mean, if you read my book, you'll see how I got crushed and stepped on and how I kept coming back. It's that simple, man. It's not going to, look it, it's not going to come fast. It's not going to fall out of the sky. Just accept the fact you got to work hard for it. Just accept it. Take one step a day. Don't be overwhelmed like, oh, I'm never going to make a billion dollars. You might. It's one step. It's easy. One step a day. Two steps a day. Three steps. Whatever steps you can do. But don't do nothing. Nothing equals nothing. Zero equals zero. That's a fact. So, yeah, life is hard. That's a given. Next. <laughs> I'm going to wake up angry. Next. I'm going to wake up depressed. Next. Somebody cheated and beat me out. Yeah, that's going to happen. Next. What are you doing to help yourself? I mean, we all can be successful. And I'm not talking about fame. You can be successful at whatever you want to be successful at. Be better at whatever you want. Raising a family. That's simple. You know? Raising a family. Do that right. You don't have to be a rock star to be successful. 
Did you ever, there's a reason for this question, did you ever have uh, a fallback plan or a plan B? The reason I ask that is because you often hear, um, especially with people who are successful at one thing or the other, the minute I have a plan B in mind, then my plan A is never gonna come true. And I don't know if I necessarily believe that, but. I, I, didn't, have a, I didn't have a plan B. Uh, I, I just, I was naive, I thought I was gonna make it. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. But um, I didn't have a plan B. I just, um, this is what I wanted to do. I always put a billion percent into whatever I'm doing. You know, uh, I really do. Uh, the challenge was, you know, being a session drummer. When I mean session drummer, in the heyday, I was booked three months straight, seven days a week. I'd have three drum sets going around in the same day in Nashville, or two drum sets. It'd be like, in Nashville, they'd record 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 6 o'clock. From 10 to one, we'd record, and we have a lunch break. They'd take that drum set from that session, move it to another uh, studio. The second drum set was already set up at the two o'clock session in the second studio. And at the end of the day, they'd tear that down and move it to the, for the next day. And then the third set, or the second set was at studio three, they'd move that to wherever they were going for the next day. I mean, it was like, I was that busy. I was saying no to like Elton John, I was so busy. and. And in L.A. there were situations like that, too. It was unbelievable, you know. So I didn't really have a plan B. It was just all going great. But this is a great segue. How, how did you how from, you know, maybe saying when you're, you know, a kid going, okay, I'm going to be in a band, I'm going to be a rock star, and you're still a rock star. I mean, look at the man. <laughs> but, um, and then becoming one of the most highly regarded and in-demand session musicians on the planet. Well, How does that happen? Okay, this is what happened in my story. So I get into the John Mellencamp band. Took four years of studying and practicing after getting into the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra to achieve my next goal, living in a house at $62 a month rent. <laughs> All I had was a little bed with a, a blanket, heating electric blanket a drum set, now I was in Indiana, not as cold as Edmonton, but cold. <laughs> drum set, bed, little bit thing, thing to hold my clothes, and a stereo. That was it. A band house, rock and roll band house. I spent four years trying to make it, and didn't happen, and then I get in the Mellencamp band. I get in the Mellencamp band, if you read my book, you'll see how I got this, just crushed after five weeks being in the band. I was gonna make this record, told everyone I was gonna make it, and John said, you're not going to play on this record. I was devastated, humiliated. I was like, it was like someone was trying to kill me and I was not going to die on the vine. I went, no, I'm not going home. I, I had to come up. I, my, my rationale was like, well, am I still the drummer in your band? And he goes, um, uh, yeah, I guess. He wanted to know what I was getting at. I said, well, I'm going to stay here and watch these guys, session guys, play my drum beats on your record. And I'm going to learn from them. I'm going to benefit from that. And if I benefit from that, you're going to benefit because I'm your drummer. And you don't have to pay me. I think that's probably why. <laughs> that was the deal breaker. That's all he heard. I don't have to pay you? Shit, all right. So I, I finally make a record uh, a year and a half later. Hardest record I ever made. Became American Fool. Canada embraced us so much. We were so big up here. Played all the hockey arenas. Everything's going great. Record after record after record. You know, it was a two-year process. We'd write songs, or John would write songs, we'd arrange them, record it. That would take one year, do publicity, and tour another year. Take a month off and do it again. And it was going, 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 and all of a sudden, the end of the Jubilee tour, John comes up to me with a bonus check, last show, says, hey, don't spend it one place, I'm taking three years off. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. See, I wasn't making the lion's share of the money, John was, because it was his record deal, I was an employee. Right. I just gotten divorced. I'm like, I gotta make a living. I got about, I quickly calculated, I got about five months worth of money saved to pay my bills. So I had to pay my wife off on the, you know, the divorce. And it wasn't a lot of money, but I didn't have much money back then. I had a mortgage, I had a child support, I had car payment, I had the regular, you know, stuff that we do. Yeah. And I immediately put two guys in my house to help split the rent. And, um, I freaked out and I thought the glass was empty. 
And now I realize the lesson I learned from that moment was the glass is always full. Because when John said, I'm done, and I'm like, holy shit, I'm out of a job. I'm sure, you guys have been fired or quit or, or somebody maybe even got divorced. It's like, oh my God, woe is me. Guess what, folks? Woe is you is right. Yeah. Feel the pain, but make something happen from that point on. So I went, okay, I've been playing with one, one rock star for eight years. Now I'm going to go play with every other rock star. <laughs> And so I went to L.A. and I was doing sessions because that was when the session thing was happening. I'd already done some sessions and I, start, I, I went to L.A. and I made it be known, uh, you know, because back then there was so much money in the music business. You'd go to clubs and you'd run into managers, agents, bands were getting signed. It was like a beehive. Everywhere you went, I'd be recording in one room. Next door would be U2 and next door to them would be Motley Crue. It was like, whoa, and I'd run into producers and songwriters. So I was networking. I, in between takes, I was on the phone networking. And after about a year, I started to get called. I got a call to do Iggy Pop record. Don was the producer, goes to the Grammys, wins two Grammys one night while we're recording. Well, that worked out great because when he did the Bob Dylan record, I got to play on it. Right. Then he did Bob Seger, I got to play on it. Then people's like, wow, Aronoff, he's this new guy. Right. I had a new career. So what looked like the glass was empty proved to me the glass is full because when, I, when John basically quit and I had no job, I created a new job. And it took a while, man. I had to, it took a year of pounding it out. I made enough money to pay my bills. It took a year to build this new business up, but I did it. Now, this happened again in my life. You know, went from vinyl to CD. And then all of a sudden, CDs went away, and it got down to downloading, music's free, streaming. All of a sudden, the record, the business is falling apart. There's no budgets. People can't fly me from Indiana. They, I lived in Indiana. They'd fly me first class, rental car, per diem, fancy rock and roll hotel, big money, be in the studio for three weeks making one record sometimes, $2,500 a day just for the room. All that money went away. And I heard somebody say in the 2000 something, hey, if you happen to be in town, we got the session you want to play. And I went, whoa, would you say happen to be in town? And I'm like, are the budgets changing? She went, yes. And I went, ding. I wasn't going to, this glass, I just remember it went empty for a second. I went, okay, that made me think. So I got an apartment in LA. Yep, immediately. Now I've got an extra two thousand dollars a month to pay because now I'm. They're not paying for flights. I got a, a you know rental plus you probably twenty five a month. And then eventually I had to move to L A. Pull all my drums out of Nashville, in New York. Everything's in L A. And eventually I had to get a studio. I have a studio where people send me files. I record way cheaper. I don't even charge for my room. So the studio is free. It's just my fee and the engineer. That was me adapting to the system. You know? This is within the last 10 years. Yeah, last 10 years. I, I could have gone, and I know of a lot of friends that went like, well, man, I'm Kenny Aronoff, man, I'm a rock star, man. If you want me, you got... Hello, man, I didn't change the rules. You got to look in the mirror and say, what is going on here? And what do you want to do? And what can you do to fit into the system? Because those who adapt survive, and those who... Well, you know, back in the good old days, it's like, yeah, but that's all it was. It's in the past. It's, yeah, it's changed. It's changed. Hey, listen, if you're not on the field, you can't score a touchdown. If you're not on the ice, you can't score a goal. Yeah. If you're on the bench too long, you get thrown off the bench, and now it's like, who's that? Dude, in my business, the fact that I can walk down I, almost any street, any airport, I'm recognized, boy, that's rare. Because, I mean, people come and go so fast. I'm not doing it for that. That just happens, mm -hmm. you know. I, this book thing was pain in the ass, but <laughs> I'm so glad I did it now because now I'm writing another book, The Method Behind the Madness, and I'm speaking, and that's a whole nother business, and what you're getting at is the tip of the iceberg right now of my speaking, but I perform when I speak. I'm taking everything that I've done my entire life and put it into a show, and you'll probably see me up here do one of these shows at some point. It's called The Kenny Aronoff Experience, How to Rock Your Life and Career. 
Sounds good, right? <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up because that's actually the next thing I wanted to, to bring up to you yes. is, so you've had this evolution throughout your career. Um, did you ever picture yourself, when you were picturing, you know, your, your future path and what was ahead of you and, and the discipline, the goals you had set for yourself, now, not only are you in demand like crazy for musicianship, you, you're now a published author, and suddenly, you're a public speaker who does these speaking engagements. Was that something that was ever in the back of your mind, say, 30 years ago? Hell no. <laughs> someone said, you're going to be, someone said, you're going to write a book and you're going to speak. I went, why would I do that? You know what I mean? That's part of like learn, life, though. You got to, you, you got to be, keep as, as focused as I am looking through a, a microscope, I've also got to remember there's a telescope. Be aware of what's going on around you. It just, it, it came, I'm grateful that Jake Brown made me write that book, you know? Right. Um, because I was fine with just pounding it out, adjusting to the system, adjusting to the, the different bands I'm touring with and the records, but now I am so excited about this new part of my career because it still is, is it's a culmination of everything I've done and do and will do. You know, it's so cool. You know, it helps that I became famous at one thing because it, people at least will, you know, oh, Kenny Aronoff, I'll speak to him. You know, so, you know, you want to be great at one thing for sure. Right. Because it does help to be great at one thing and then start adding the other things. Yeah, to your you know, repertoire. Yeah, repertoire. Because yeah. you, you got to be known great at one thing, you know? Um, I promised we would take uh, a question or two from the audience, and we've been hogging all the time here. So does it, if any, Billy, okay. Does anyone have any questions? Hey, you can ask me questions about your personal life, about the book, <laughs> about diet. Uh, you know, think of me as Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz, <laughs> all combined, and a rock star. You got one. You got one? Uh, in the book, you talk sometimes about how oh. Mellencamp was not an easy guy to work with. Uh, with all the changes you've gone through in your personal life in the past decade or so, would you be able to work with somebody like Mellencamp now? Did everybody what? hear that? Oh, yeah. He say, you basically what you said it was in the book, you, you got a feeling... You don't even know half of it, but in the book, you got a feeling that John Mellencamp was not easy to work with, and because of where I'm at now, would I even consider working with somebody else like that? Okay. First of all, you know, being a session guy and a hired gun, like the movie tonight, I listen, I learn, and I lead, because I'm a drummer, but I ain't the boss. So when you're not the boss... I'm going to have to deal with multiple personalities. One of my talents and what I definitely am aware of is the ability to get along with different people. But the funny thing is, when I left the Mellencamp band, and I defend him in the books, I understand why he's the way he is, and I defend him. That doesn't mean he's not the way he is, though. That was my point in the book was, look it. What, my jo I wasn't trying to go after John. I just wanted you to see what it was like. Because, you know, I'm flying around in a private jet and staying at the Ritz Carlton's and <clears throat> we're selling out arenas and girls are throwing underwear and bras at us and blah, 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 the whole thing. And somebody might go, man, that guy's got it easy. I was, trying to, I was just trying to be honest, but in a classy way and explain what really went on. John was fighting for his life just like me. He is not one to die on the vine. He's fighting, and he got dumped, and he get, they changed his name from John Mellencamp yeah. to Johnny Cougar. Yeah. He was pissed, and then Ross lost his record deal, and he has to go home where his uncle settled things with fist fights, and he's got to go home and say, well, my name's Johnny Cougar. And they're like, what? What's wrong with your Mellencamp heritage name? Well, my name's Cougar. Bam, what are you doing, boy? You know, that kind of thing. It's like, so this guy was a fighter, but that didn't mean it was fun to be around, as you saw. <laughs> I don't want to mention any names, but the day, when, the, two weeks after I got out of the band, I went, I'll never work for another asshole again. I got a call, I can't say who it is, I don't want to say, by somebody 
that wasn't exactly like John, but was a very intense boss. And it was a job that, and a, a, a tour I would never turn down. It was huge. So it, it was like, I mean, within, I think within a week of me saying that, I got the call to work for somebody and I went, wow, there's a life lesson. So to answer your question, yes, I will work for people. Um, at this point in my career, I will work for people like that to a point. Right. It might be they're paying me a lot of money, it's not a very long tour, or something like that. I might see how much I can deal with. I have a conversation with myself and go, all right, you've worked with assholes before, you know how to do this. Maybe I, don't, I won't take that person, you know, they're the one in pain, not me. Yeah. And maybe I'll just, you know, just do my job and leave. It, don't take it personal. It's a job. There's a lot of things you can think about. On the other hand, music a lot of times is personal. So there is a hang factor involved. You have to weigh it all up. And then I look at myself as the coach and the athlete, the father and the son. When the little kids cry and go, Dad, I don't want to play with this person anymore. I have to sometimes go, what's... Should I honor what the son wants or should I tell the son, listen, we have to grow up and handle this, but it won't be forever. I have those conversations with myself, you know? When you took the tour after the, the unnamed person, did artist after the Mellencamp thing, did you already know, did that person already have a reputation? You knew what you were getting into? They were or huge, huge. But well, I mean a reputation for being difficult to work with. Uh, I had heard, they were, okay. th that band was kind of a complex band. They were going through a lot of stuff. I, I mean, I, it was great experience, but it was difficult. They, it was like going, it'd be like hanging out with people that are going through a tough time and you're caught up in it. Yeah. You, I mean, I was in their family now. I was the guest. Yeah. I can't change them. I wanted to raise my hand and say, hey, I know what you're going through. I've been through this before. I've seen this. But you won't want to know from me what you don't want to hear my opinion. But I could have told them. It wouldn't have matter if I told them anyway. They had to find out themselves. They had to find out for themselves. Yeah. So it was a difficult environment. But man, I'm so glad I did it. It was great. Great experience. Anyone else want to go? Yeah. Over in the back. Do you want to go to the mic? Uh, no, I can, I can oh. speak up. Uh, all those guys that were sitting, that were sitting here, we uh, had the pleasure to uh, watch you uh, play with John Fogarty the last time they were in Edmonton. Great to hear him introduce you as the greatest rock and roll drummer in the world, and uh, and also how proud he was, or how happy he was to uh, get you uh, in his employ. Uh, I have a lot of respect for John Fogarty and the, the shitstorm that he went through yeah. in his life uh, with record companies and credence. So uh, you guys probably have a lot of magic and a lot of things in common uh, that uh, help you guys uh, play and perform. Uh, I saw John twice here in Edmonton, and saw you play Bob himself and us guys. And uh, so maybe just kind of comment a little bit on Fogarty, because uh, we're big Fogarty fans. Well, John, 15 years old, or however, 14, and I was rolling joints on his album covers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I was like, you know, and I, if somebody had told me then, especially when I was high, hey, you're going to be playing with this guy someday, I went, ah, <laughs> no way. You know, and <laughs> So it's kind of iconic, you know. And uh, do you know the story of how I got hooked up with him? No, I don't. That's why I want to know. Oh, okay. This is great. I want to see the connection. All right. So he's, he, he, for everybody who doesn't know, John Fogarty was, you know, the lead singer, the producer, the guitar player, uh, uh, songwriter for Creedence Clearwater, one of the most successful rock and, bowl, rock and roll bands ever. His music's played on the radio more than the Beatles, the Stones, anybody. I mean, it's... It's everywhere. To it's, this day. To this day. In yeah. movies, uh, ads, uh, it's everywhere. So um, he was so disappointed and so hurt by his arrangement. His, he, had a, he had a bad record deal. But you know what? Truthfully, most people did back then. Yeah. It was a new business. Yeah. It, it was like all, all the artists were getting screwed. There was a standard contract. John took it personal. I, I personally think that the record company situation, the deal he made, was triggering other issues that he had experienced in his life already for it to be that painful. 
But that's, I'm not a therapist. Well, I am kind of, I'm Dr. Phil, Dr. Oz. But um, I feel that that was a deep trigger thing. The bottom line is, and then, and then, then he got into, you know, it was a, a, a democracy vote in that band. And basically it got down to the, the other two guys were not seeing things his way. And that's two against one. Yeah. And so, and actually, at, well, at one point it was four guys because it was his brother in there. So, Tom, that's really three guys against one. And John took it personal. And um, it eventually was the demise of Creedence Clearwater when they were at the peak of their career. John did some solo records under the name of Blue Ridge Rangers. And then eventually John Fogarty. But then he got so disillusioned by the business, he quit. Yeah. Now his wife, Julie, convinced him you got to get back into music, you know, because you're you're a miserable, miserable person, unhappy. He'll admit it: drinking, smoking, like, like dying on the vine. He was definitely dying on the vine. So she gets him back into writing songs and getting confident. He starts practicing five hours, three to five hours a day. Wow. He's that guy. He still does it three hours a day. He's a true musician. Really? Yep, a true musician. So then he started to make this record, Blue Moon Swamp. Do you know that one? Okay. So he spent five years getting ready to go in the studio. He spent five years recording Blue Moon Swamp. That's 10 years. Jesus, man. And when I was, we were making it with Mellencamp, you really, you had to put a record out every year to two years yeah. to, to stay successful, or they're going to forget about you. So John... It starts working through all these drummers. In the fifth year, I'm the 30th and last drummer he tried. 30th? 30th. He went through everybody. Jeff Percaro, Vinnie Caliuta, everybody in L.A. He, or, or the drummer from Stevie Ray Vaughan. Uh, he went, the country drummers. He went through everybody. Recording to tape. I walk in. You know, just another day for me. It's another session. I'm, I'm stoked, though. It's Fogarty, Creedence. But a weird thing they said was, don't bring any drums. Just bring your sticks. I'm like, wow. Everybody always wants my drums. They want my sound. John tuned the snare drum. Happened to be my favorite snare drum, Ludwig Superphonic 400, 1962, which I modeled. That drum, I created my signature snare drum off of that drum. And... Um, so we had my favorite snare drum, and he tuned the kick drum, he, certain heads, packing, everything. He had somebody tune the toms. The bottom line, so here's what we do. is a bass player, me and John. I don't know anything. I hear the song. I write a chart out. We go out. They don't use a click track. They have a click in your, to count. So John would count off every song, every time, every, every take. One, two. One, two, three, four, go, 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 you know, do the song. Do it again. Then we go in and listen. Two takes. Go back in, two more takes. Go back and listen. Two takes, listen, two takes, listen, two takes, listen, two takes, listen. Simple song for three and a half hours. I'm like, wow, lunch break. The next song. Okay, cool. Same process. Okay, I now know what's going on. And uh, his feedback, he liked what I was doing. He didn't have too much to say. Just do more of that. Try that. We came back the next day. Same two songs. By the way, I found out later, they weren't even getting bass or guitar or drum. They were just, or vocals. They were just trying to get drums. And then he was going to redo everything to that. Okay. I'm like, wow. Okay. I can't get, started to get sick of these songs. Wednesday. Same two songs. Thursday, <laughs> same two songs. I ain't going to die in the vine, so pull the gun away. Are you nuts? Friday, school's out, man. Same two songs. I'm like, holy gee, I know these songs. He told me the next week when I came in, well, well let's say this, years later, I'm obviously playing with him. Years later, I, he taps me on the leg at 10 in the morning. I just recorded two takes of this song, of a song. He goes, man, how do you do this at 10 in the morning? I went, I don't know, John, because usually I'm sleeping at 10 in the morning, number one. Number two, I'm not, I'm not, the, uh, I got a ways to go with this. And he held up 10 fingers. He looks at me and I go, what? He says, I practiced drums for 10 years 
four hours a day because I decided I have to play every instrument on my records. Ten years and I couldn't play the beat. You're playing that simple, simple beat you're playing right now. He says, you were the 30th drummer on Blue Moon Swamp and when I heard you, I went, that's the drummer I've been looking for my entire life. Wow. How about that? And that's in his book, too. He put it that in his book. Holy. Wow. <laughs> from, you know, from one of my heroes. Yeah, but his, yeah, it's, I mean, you can go on a whole tangent just on the Fogarty experience. Oh, yeah, it's pretty, with, tri we do three hour, four hour sound checks still, day of a show. That's tough for a drummer, yeah. especially when you're 28 years old like me. Yeah. When I was 20, I could do it. 28 is getting tough. Yeah, oh yeah, right over there. Yeah. Speak up so we can all hear you. Oh, okay. Um, so you were in the early 90s with Mel and Camp on the Love and Happiness tour. I believe you started the show. With I started the show. Yeah, that was very cool. I saw the Fogarty show a couple years back, but when I saw you with Joe Cocker, uh, opening for the Guess Who, I believe, on the Canada. Front yeah, of the were, were we opening up for the Guess Who? I think so. But yeah. I, I was looking, I was at the back of the Or oh, they opened up for us. They should have. <laughs> I think they did. I think they did. But either way, I, I, was really big, I am a big fan of Joe Cocker, who isn't. But I looked and I, that's Kenny Arnold. <laughs> and so, what was that like? To, to, how long did you work? I, I, record, I recorded and toured with Cocker for on and off for 10 years. Did you, did you play on When the Night Comes? No, I wish I could have. The cool thing is like a lot, all, most of his touring drummers didn't record, but I did. And I did a song, is, it, is there an album called Respect Yourself or? Yeah, there's a single off that. I did Respect yeah, Yourself, yeah, okay. but there's an album I think called that. Yeah. Well, let me tell you something. Whoo, talk about rock and roll history. Playing with him and hearing that voice and thinking of Woodstock yeah. and playing a little help from your friends with that scream. Oh my God. <laughs> Every night I, I get, you know, when I hear the organ, I'm like, I can't believe I'm going to be playing this in about five, 15 seconds. I'm going to come in, you know, and then boom, 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 boom. I'm like, here it comes. I'm like, boom, what would you do if I sing out of a tune? It's like, wow. And I'm like, goosebumps. You know, try. For my friends, oh my God! And that's just the one song, you know. Oh my! It's God. those moments when you're like, you know what? Life's pretty damn. Oh good. man, dude, that was like they, they play with your heroes like that, and what a nice guy, a legend. You know, I mean, these, you know, it's like even though I'm big, successful, I w doesn't matter if Joe was still alive or any of these guys that I respect. I would still feel that feeling like I was nobody and I hadn't made it yet because I remember the impact of, that's why hanging with Ringo Starr and Paul McCartney was like, I did my job when I did the show. I didn't think about anything but my job. Like I said, I get serious. That's not nervous. Just do your job. And then afterwards I'm like, holy shit. I just played with Ringo Starr and McCartney. I mean, those are the guys. If it wasn't for them, I told Ringo, I said, nah, I can't tell you. He said, no, no, tell me. Nah, nah, this is right in the, in the big the venue, in front of everybody. I went, well, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have be playing drums now. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't play music, blah, blah, blah. You've heard that a million times. Went, no, I love hearing that. And his wife's going, no, no, that's awesome you said that. And I mean, he... But it's true. I mean, it, I will never get over those, what it felt like to be a kid wanting to play with these guys. Now I'm playing with them. Holy shit. So let me put you on the spot for a second. And you might not have an answer for this. And if you don't, that's OK. Because I'm putting you on the spot. Do I love being put on the spot. Give it to me. Uh, if you had 
if you had to, if you were forced to answer this question, um, either your favorite artist that you've ever played with or favorite gig that you've ever played? What's my favorite gig? Yeah. Yeah, these are tough because there's yeah. so many. There's so many. Yeah, That's so why many. I said it's tough. Yeah, like all those Kenneth. You just give us your top 25. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Well, I mean, you're doing Kennedy Center Honors with Sting, Springsteen, uh, you know, Elton John, yeah. uh, uh, playing, um, I mean, those guys are ridiculously iconic, uh, bad mofos, playing with Dave Grohl, you know, Bruno Mars, Lady Gaga, you know, uh, doing the Letterman show, and Letterman talks to me right on the air, you know, I think those are moments that are huge. Obama inauguration, I played with 26... 25 bands, you know, uh, these are huge uh, moments that, you know, you're playing with the best of the best. So, yeah, yeah it's really hard. Steven Tyler, you know, at the Kennedy Center Honors, playing with McCartney. I mean, all okay, these. Okay, well, let me ask you this instead then. Is there somebody that you haven't had the opportunity to play with that yet yeah. that you'd love to? Oh, I'd love to go on tour with Queens of the Stone Age, ah. Rage Against the Machine, you know, that type of thing. Um, well, I'd love to go on tour with McCartney. He pays really good, too. <laughs> so, you know, and, um, you know, um, Muse. I like them a lot. That'd be awesome. Their music is great. And they, yeah, and they put on, it's a great Ridiculous show. show. Yeah, yeah. And that guy's ridiculous guitar player, songwriter, singer, piano player. Yeah. I mean, to be in the company of that, I mean, that's, yeah. Those, that would be great. Queen, if they were around. Hendrix, if oh, he was yeah. around. Zeppelin, The Who, all those bands I'd love to play with. Um, I forgot you said Queen and, and you never got a chance to play with. No, I played, uh, never played with anybody with Queen. Not, Brian May came and saw us play with Chicken Foot and pointed me out as like, wow. But I never been able to do anything with Queen. Isn't it amazing how you go back, I mean, no, nobody performs like that. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Do you find it fascinating, maybe you don't, you see, you're around it every day, but when you see an artist that's been around for, for because I'm going to go back to the McCartney thing for a second. So I saw, I saw McCartney here the two, three years ago he was here. I mean, he's been here a few times, but I had never seen, it was my first time seeing a Beatle of any kind. And um, we went to that show, and here's this guy, you know, 70 years old or whatever he was at the time. And it's like a three hour show, and his voice still sounds great. And he's got the, which is, I think, why you were playing the, the show with them um, that you referred to earlier. He's got the tightest band. Yeah. You know, it's just killer. But his voice is great. It's a great show. And here's a guy that, let's face it, he could rest on his laurels if he wanted to. Yeah, I think he's the richest uh, musician in the world. So what's it like playing with 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 musicians like that, like yourself, that have been doing it for a long time, but haven't just decided to phone it in, you know, for the paycheck. They're still, you're still doing it because of passion. Yeah, is there is no it. phoning in for me. When I'm recording by myself in my studio with an unsigned artist that nobody will ever hear of, when that red light goes on, man, I'm like, whoa, this is going to be here forever. Yeah. This is, <clears throat> this is, I can't, no. But then when I'm, the big thing, playing with McCartney was like, you know, and Ringo, it's iconic. And then to hang out with them, Paul's talking about, you know, uh, when we went to, we came over to the USA, we were just, we thought we were old. We were 24 smoking cigarettes, and we thought we were old, and we were like, wow, we're in the United States, we're in New York City. Wow, we've really made it. And they're driving to the uh, Ed Sullivan show. They're like, wow, look at all those people. What's going on? Uh, the drivers, I think that's because of you guys. <laughs> what? Really? Wow, that's crazy. And they're about to go on stage, and, and they're behind the curtain. And the guy taps Paul. And he says, I can't believe this guy says to me. I mean, I'm only 24. He goes, hey, how does it feel like to be playing in front of 72 million people? <laughs> taps him on the shoulder, curtains opens up, and he has to walk on. He says, that's not a real nice thing to say to a young kid. <laughs> no, this is Paul talking like that. And he says like stuff like, yeah, man, we were, when we were in Hamburg, you know, I, we went to a music store and the guy's in a jacket and tie because, you know, rock and roll was just starting out. 
and the guy's playing a weird chord. And, and Paul goes, man, Johnny, look at that chord he's playing. What, what is that thing? And the guy says, well, it's a, a minor six chord. He shows him. He says, you know, we, I took that thing and I used it in Michelle. And I never used it again. It's maybe one other song, but basically we didn't use that chord maybe once or twice. I mean, he's telling stuff like that. We're like, <laughs> I just love it. He was just like hanging out with a badass musician, but he's your hero too. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I, I like being around the best musicians because everybody listens to everybody else. It, they're badass, but they listen, they understand team, the, the concept of team. Right. They understand that four guys are stronger than one. You know, that's why, yeah. you know, in sports, I mean, that's why the New England Patriots are always in the, in the playoffs, or if not the Super Bowl, that's why they won the Super Bowl after a 21-3 deficit because they're a team and they understand it's not about me, it's about us. And what can we do? What can I do to help you? And what can he do to help you and, and win this game? And so when you're around great musicians, a lot of times it, it's like that. Everybody gets it. Well, okay, we have one more. Let's take one more question and then we're going to get, I know a lot of you have bought books or want to. I would like to maybe have Kenny sign it. So uh, let's take one more question from the audience here. If you can speak up so we can all hear you. I always felt that uh, without Ringo Starr, there wouldn't have been the Beatles. That is a fact, sir. And uh, so um, if you just speak to that and the position you have as a drummer, because it's well, the thing about Ringo, I was one of the guys, as much as I loved him, I didn't think he was the greatest drummer because I was listening to Buddy Rich, Elvin right. Jones, all these great jazz drummers had monster technique. And then, you know, you started to see very quickly some amazing badass drummers that had lots of technique. What I didn't understand uh, as a kid, and is that whole thing of team, how you fit in on the team. The Beatles would never be the Beatles without Ringo. His personality, his musical ideas. I wrote three articles on Ringo Starr for Modern Drummer. I remember they said they wanted to have me as a writer. And I wrote one article, I started to write one article, I called the guy up in one day and said, I need two articles. I called him again on the same day and said, I need three articles. Because I started transcribing every beat he played on all his records. I went, whoa, 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 this guy's, way more in clever and interesting. I didn't understand what a purpose of a drummer is. Purpose of a drummer, I, I didn't even think that way. But recently I've understood what a purpose of a drummer is to be in a band like that. And the purpose is to get their song on the radio to be number one. That's the purpose of a drummer. Every beat, everything you do, every cymbal, every cra everything you do should serve the song to get the song on the radio to be number one. That's like you getting hired by Microsoft and they say, what they want you to do is make them millions of dollars. Well, if you get a song on the radio, be number one, you made that corporation, the Beatles, millions of dollars, which I've done for a lot of corporations. You know, Celine, <laughs> two Celine Dion records, 40 million records each. If I had anything to do with that, somebody made a lot of money. Same with, you know, all kinds of artists where they, they, they you know, I play on a hit single that sold millions of millions of copies. Somebody made a lot of money. That's my purpose. So Ringo was just, his, his musicality, his feel, was just unique to him and his personality. So he was definitely, he is a bad mofo. And when I played along with him, I was up, oh man, the feel, there's nobody that sounds like him. So that's amazing, that's great. That just shows that everybody's different, everybody has an individual voice. He had the, has that. As far as the position be... Wait, what, what, what? Is he not left-handed? Yeah, he's left-handed. He plays a right-handed kid? Yeah, left-handed player playing right-handed kid. So when I did um, something, something, I started with my left hand on the tom, left, right, left on the rack tom, right, left, right on the floor tom, land on the downbeat with the left hand, which is weird, with your right foot, and then immediately take over with my right hand playing right-handed. So it's... 
I would I rehearsed that 20 times while they were doing a set change before that song that Joe Walsh was singing on the TV show. I had to click in, I practiced going three, four, three, four, and everyone has to be even. Like, twenty times. And then when they said, when I knew that, ladies and gentlemen, Joe Walsh, three, four, nailed it at sixty-three beats a minute. Because Joe Walsh didn't want it sixty-four beats; he wanted sixty-three. He knew the difference, and dude. I saw it, I killed it, nailed it. But that's the RPS. Repetition of anything is the preparation for success. So, yeah, Ringo had a very unique drum fills and things because he was a left-handed drummer, playing right-handed. He played the high, a lot of times he played right-handed, but he was a left-handed drummer, so a lot of times his fills would be left-handed, but then he'd play right-handed the other way. It's crazy. It, the whole thing about them is unique. Okay, so we're going to wrap this up with a two-part movie question. First of all, because uh, we haven't talked about it at all, give people just a little sense of what they're going to see tonight. Because I'm assuming every person here is coming to see Hired Gun tonight. Oh, yeah, yeah, we have to assume that. All right, Hired Gun uh, is a, a documentary about people who get hired for recordings and touring. Uh, to give a little bit of insight on that world. And... I guess I'm an expert in both fields because obviously I've been on 300 million records sold and I've toured with, you know, 17 years with Mellencamp and then Bob Seger, uh, Rena Tours with, you know, the Smashing Pumpkins, Joe Cocker, uh, Melissa Etheridge, uh, John Fogarty, Michelle Branch, the uh, Goo Goo Dolls, Styx, you, you know, it just goes on and on. So I am definitely a hired gun and you're going to see some killer stories. There's two very emotional stories in the movie that that center around Ozzy Osbourne and uh, Billy Joel that blew me away because I know both the musicians, Rudy uh, Sarzo, a bass player with Ozzy, and Libby DeVito, the drummer who used to play with um, uh, Billy Joel, and it blew my mind to hear their story. It was like, that was the, the, the my, oh my God, part of the movie. But then there's some, you know, just, it's rock and roll, man. It's, it's fun to see behind the scenes What's really going on, you know? Yeah. And that's what the movie's basically about, man. It's about guys like us, get hired guns. And then the second question is, and this is gonna tie it right back to the beginning of our conversation, which is when you were young, starting out, getting your college education, uh, and, and a few of the stories you're telling, particularly about the one uh, instructor or mentor that was really, really- Hard on me? Hard on you. Um, did you see, or would it bring back too many bad memories, did you see the movie Whiplash? I saw Whiplash, and oh yeah, I could relate to that, that, that scenario. It was a little bit over the top, but, I, but the, the concept is very, very real. I have been in situations recording live, uh, t taking lessons that are pretty brutal like that, and I, I realized, wow, now I look back and I and and then when I wrote my book I realized wow I'm you know that that phrase uh, fight or flight well I'm a fight or fight guy yeah uh, I yeah. didn't re I didn't know that I just thought I was a nice guy that wanted what I wanted but oh my God I'm a fight or fight guy but I'm fighting for myself and I'm, I'm I I don't want to die on the vine I I'm just no way no way because to me uh, failing was like dying and uh, I didn't know that about me but I am that guy you know and. Um, the ending, I don't think it's realistic whatsoever. I don't think the, the instructor would sabotage his own show right. just to make a point to, to put this kid down. That, with an ego like that instructor had, he wouldn't sabotage, he wouldn't do that. No, so that it hurts him that, ultimately. Yeah, it hurts him, his ego's too big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He could do, he could set, he could do another thing. He could wait for him behind a dark alley and hit him with a baseball <laughs> bat. There's other things he could do. Not sabotage his own show. <laughs> Kenny, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. We'll see you down here. You know, if you don't book, if you don't, go for sale right over here. It's our lot. Good you, job, sir. man. That was awesome. That was great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome.
Yeah. I told you I can talk. 